Good morning. We'd like to go ahead and get started so that we can um, continue our, our run here of staying on time um, for the schedule. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. James Boyle, who is the William Neal Reynolds Professor of Law at Duke Law School and founder of Duke Center for the Study of Public, Do Public Domain. He is also current chairman of the Board of Creative Commons, which some of you, many of you may know what that is, but if not, it's a nonprofit corporation that seeks to make easier the sharing and reuse of intellectual product. Two years ago, I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Boyle speak at the Delane Conference on Emerging Libraries at Rice University. And the theme of that event was how libraries were meeting the challenges of new models for scholarship and publication, and how emerging technologies were often informing and confounding the resulting conversations. Dr. Boyle's talk, Science Wars, The Next Generation, examined the opportunities that open access could afford scientific scholarship and change for the better how researchers share and expose the work they're doing. So when the time came this year to put together our program for Faculty Academy, Dr. Boyle immediately came to mind. That said, I wonder if some of our attendees were curious at the choice of an intellectual property scholar as a keynote speaker for our annual conference on teaching and learning technologies. And I confess that provoking wonder at the choice was, in some ways, a deliberate provocation on my part. Some of you may be further confounded when I tell you that Dr. Boyle will be making no use of technology whatsoever in his presentation. <laughs> However, I believe that the ideas that he's going to be exploring with us today, how universities need to challenge their assumptions and cultural practices with regards to knowledge creation, are very important to our understanding of how technology is changing the landscape of education. It seems vital to remember that what our innovative uses of technology for teaching and learning actually lead to are new ways for creating, sharing, and exposing the life and work of our institutions and of our individual minds. So I'm sure all of us are greatly looking forward to Dr. Boyle's comments and discussion of cultural agoraphobia, what universities need to know about our bias against openness. Dr. Boyle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you also for inviting me here. This is a fascinating um, conference and really a wonderful idea to have um, a conference which brings together the faculty of a university at the end of a semester to reflect uh, on the kinds of ideas that have come up, the challenges that face them, and also obviously bring in people from outside is really, I think, uh, something that more universities should do. So I applaud you, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I note with some consternation that they took the coffee away before I spoke. I, you, you noted it with even more consternation. Uh, I think this is kind of raising the stakes on me. I have to, you know dance, caper, in order to keep you awake. I'm also, since I'm sort of a, something of a social theorist, I'm fascinated by the division of the room, the, the ostentatious signs, this table has power, <laughs> and then the poor dispossessed, the campesinos who sit at the back, of the, I'm with you guys, you know, and, and come the end of my talk, there will be a revolution when you, where you storm the podium and take their, their power and their little dongles too, so... Um, um, I, uh, I, I also, do these look like angel wings to anyone? It's, it's, a, it's a strange iconography. In any event, um, I, I, I have learned to start by um, explaining the, the, the absence of, of PowerPoints. I, I gave a, a, a talk at an EduCause uh, conference in San Francisco. It was a plenary, and, and so they said, um, great, you know, what are you going to talk about? And they were very excited, and they said, well, and... Um, send us your technology. And I was like, no, I don't have any technology. He's like, well, no, we can take slides in whatever form. It's like, I'm not using the slides at all. And they're like, or movies. I was like, no, I'm not using movies either. It was a long pause. This is a plenary. I was like, no, no I understand. It's a plenary. He's like, well, well, what will you do with the screen, they said. <laughs> I said, turn it off. And they go, you could have a spinning logo. Um, <laughs> Finally, one of them said, how will you communicate? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, I use words, sometimes concepts, ideas, and occasionally hand gestures. Um, <laughs> after I gave the talk, uh, this guy came up to me and goes, that was amazing. And of course, I, uh, I committed the error that any person trained in the law should never, uh, should never commit, which is to ask one question too many. I was like, oh, really? What did you like about it in particular? He's like, you're a no PowerPoint guy. I've heard about them. I ran outside and got my friend. It's a no PowerPoint guy, I said. 
So at the very least, I hope to achieve the uh, distinction of being a no PowerPoint guy today. That's the, I set the bar low, kind of like defense contractors, seeing as I'm in Virginia. You know, if you set the bar low in terms of what kinds of success, you know, I figure I may actually surpass it. Um, so um, my subject is cultural agoraphobia, fear of openness. And I want to start with um, a, a questionnaire, a little test for you. Um, in each case, I'm going to take you back about um, 17 years to 1992. Um, some of you, of course, are far too young to remember then. But for those of you who can manage, some of you are far too old to remember that. <laughs> um, but for those in the, mid the happy middle who can actually remember 1992, I want to ask a series of questions. And I want you honestly to reflect on what the, the self that inhabited you in 1992 would have done to decide the various quandaries that I put before you. Let's say that you've been selected to advise um, the, the government on a new worldwide computer system which it wants to contribute to setting up. Certainly a national computer system, but, but, but ideally a worldwide computer system. And your job is to sit in there and to contribute your expertise, your knowledge, whatever kind it is, to the discussion with a group of lawyers and uh, people from commerce, some, some bureaucrats, some people from the commerce department, some people from various agencies, academics. And they're all going to sit there, and they're basically going to decide. And you've got two systems that are put before you. So the first system is one that, if you're even older than um, the, the people who can remember 1992, you may remember something vaguely similar to what the French had in Minitel or the British had in CFAX, it's basically a terminal, a series of terminals. Now remember, not a general purpose computer, a terminal is a thing which has predefined functions. There's a certain number of functions, generally limited by the number of buttons that there actually are there. Each button has a function, maybe there's a combination of multiple functions, but the point is the terminal is hardwired to do certain things and only certain things. That's the point of a terminal, right? The point of a terminal is to restrict the choices available to the user. The terminal is connected to a network. The network is one which is an authorized network. In order to get on the network, someone has to decide that you are sufficiently credible, sufficiently uh, non-criminal, sufficiently, um, uh, sufficiently uh, respectable. Uh, to actually gain access to it. And so just as with Minitel or CFAX, we would find you know, our prominent newspapers, perhaps, at broadcasting studios, government agencies, perhaps a university or two, um, basically institutions which have some degree of warrant, some degree of credibility, some degree of power, probably some degree of money, technological capacity. And those institutions, and really no one else would be connected to the system, your job then would be to receive information from those entities. Um, now, you could do a bunch of things with it. You could print it. That would be one of the buttons. Another button, this is kind of revolutionary, you might even be able to send a story to another user on the network. But you are a consumer, uh, not a producer. And you're a consumer who is consuming from a pre-authorized list of people on a network where functionality is deliberately restricted to a few whitelisted functions, right? That's the, this is not an accident, this is the central DNA of the system. That's network number one. Network number two is, as you would realize now, the World Wide Web running over um, the internet. The internet, of course, exists as of uh, 1992. The World Wide Web is just coming into, uh, is just being created. Um, but as you, hear about this network, you, there are some sort of scientists there, kind of, they're not kind of as slick as the guys who presented network number one, they're, they're a little shaggy, you know, some Birkenstocks in evidence. Um, um, and they say, you know, this is great, this is, this is going to be a system, that, a dumb network with, you know, smart terminals on the end. It's going to be, we have this principle we'll call end to end. The network will just carry anything. And what's more, it'll be a decentralized network. It will constantly heal itself around any kind of blockage. Um, the, uh, the line, uh, the internet treats censorship as a malfunction and roots around it is technically true, so long as one doesn't live behind the great firewall of China. The internet does that. The internet is a system which 
actually does, because of its distributed nature, not rely on a single connection. The revolutionaries storm the radio station and then are in control of the means of communication, but has multiple possible pathways from one user to another. And even more dramatic, recipients of information over this network are also people who can send information over this network. They themselves are producers, not consumers. They can put stuff up. And what's more, because the system will just pass any properly formatted packet, they can put stuff up where stuff is a value yet to be specified. We don't know what stuff is. Is stuff text? Is it streaming video? Is it sound? Is it interactively created tag clouds? Is it Google Maps? We just don't know because this is an open network. It's open as to who connects to it. It's open as to the uses to which you put to it. And the things at the ends are general purpose computers, not terminals. They can do whatever you are smart enough to program them to do. And the network will then carry them out and put them in touch with any other set of people out there in the world who have a similar general purpose computer and a net connection. Okay, so the two networks have been presented. Now the discussion will ensue. Okay, so network two is clearly a disaster waiting to happen. There will be porn. Check. There will be strangely articulate letters from the sons of Nigerian oil ministers who have <laughs> money that they kindly are willing to let you bring into your bank account for only a few financial details. Check. There will be idiots. Check, check, check. There will be ranting. There will be bile. There will be vituperation. Yes. Stupid rumors will be spread. Uh-huh. There will be piracy, illicit copying of content of every kind. Yes, indeed. No one could know if the stuff on this network is true. Anyone could connect to it. I mean, anyone. My next door neighbor, and he's weird could get online and say stuff about the Iraq war. And I mean, you know, I mean, the point is you don't even know who's talking to you and it's just coming down there. And what about these viruses that I hear about? Oh my God, and Trojans and, I mean, okay. And besides, do you honestly think someone's gonna do commerce on a network like this? I mean, really, on an uncontrolled network? Like, oh yeah, they're gonna be like big companies that are gonna make billions of dollars on this. Uh -huh, sure, no. It's clear that network two is a disaster. What we need for communication, what we need for authenticity, what we need for veracity, what we need in order to stop disgusting porn, there will be disgusting porn, from spreading everywhere, what we need in order to stop the idiots and the ranters and the bigots and the people who are just plain dumb from spewing their bile all over the world is a nice, controlled, safe, network that will just let you do a bunch of things. And to be honest, guys, come on. If you're a capitalist, you really tell me you're going to like invest in network two? No. It's obvious network two is a disaster. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, we got the internet. And some of you out there, I'm sure, would have said, no, I would have voted for it in 1992. But I think that a fair-minded survey would, would actually have found, had it been presented that way, and everything that I said, but for the fact that commerce wouldn't invest in it, is true, right? There is porn. There are lunatics. There is bile, right? There is massive illicit copying. There is hateful behavior. There is spam. There are Trojans. There are viruses. And there's all the rest of the net, too, that you happen to know about. But could you have imagined that? 17 years ago? Could you have looked at that and said, no, 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 like a gay Iraqi blogger will be able to speak to millions of people around the world about what it's like to be gay and Iraqi in an uh, occupied city for the cost of a net connection. We can mash up information from uh, the Virginia uh, police departments on crime rate and we can correlate it with the amount of money that is spent on the local schools and we can put it all in Google Maps and we can overlay it with environmental data and we can have new kinds of citizen activism and we could create software over this network and have people who've never met acting as ver collaborators with each other and I could talk to someone from another country and another culture and I could put up a blog and I could find information that would be produced in this 
decentralized way and through the weird quasi peer review of search engines, um, I would actually not get as much of the bile or the idiocy. I would actually get useful information. But let's face it, that just doesn't, as of 17 years ago, sound credible to me. I love openness. I would like to think of myself as a person who tilts in that direction. I would have voted for Minitel. Ask yourself what you would have done. Second um, hypothetical, 17 years ago. Uh, I come to you and I say, OK, I need you to um, divide the room in two halves. You know, um, Each side has to brainstorm on a plan to put together the greatest encyclopedia the world has ever known. I want it in most of the large languages of the world. I want it updated in real time. I want it to be far more comprehensive than the Encyclopedia Britannica. I want it to be the authoritative source for information worldwide. Each of you has to come up, each side of the room has to come up with a business plan for how to create it. So we'll make this side of the room the conventionalists. Sorry, guys. They come up, they say, well, you know, it's pretty easy to see what you want. First of all, what you need is a large corporation. It should be vertically integrated. We're going to have to make some hard decisions about what goes in and what doesn't go in. There are going to be lots of contentious subjects, you know, Israel, Palestine, feminism, whatever, right? There's going to, it's going to need a lot of, it, a lot of you know, top-down control. We're going to need the best experts in the world. They're going to have to be paid. They're going to have to be paid a lot. Um, and then we don't actually trust them. Um, so we're going to have peer reviewers, and they're going to have to be paid too. Um, and then, you know, we kind of suspect that they actually won't, the best experts won't be doing the writing. It'll be their graduate students uh, or their oppressed assistant professors. So we want multiple layers of review just to make sure all of this stuff is right. And when it finally gets there, once it's been through, then we want to rigorously edit it for style and consistently, consistency and translate it, of course, into other languages. Uh, to recover the investment, the enormous investment necessary to do this, uh, we're going to need um, really strong copyrights over our material. People are going to be absolutely forbidden from copying it. Trademarks are going to be vital to us because we want to like put the signal of like this is the authoritative source. You know, the Encyclopedia Boileania stands for truth, right? And no one can use that logo except with our permission and a fee. Um, and the whole thing is going to be run in a kind of top-down hierarchical way that will make the the Prussian army or Microsoft look like a, a commune. Um, <laughs> and this side of the room says, OK, what's your plan? We'll have like a website, and people can like put stuff up. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I made you Valley Girls. OK. <laughs> now, Jimmy Wales does not, in fact, talk like a Valley Girl. Um, but um, admit it, if I had described to you the system, uh, the system of Wikipedia, if I had told you this will work, I mean, you would have said, I have a really nice padded jacket. It's comfortable, and it will keep your arms safely behind your back. Um, the point is this runs against all of our conceptions about not just networks. We talked about before. That's technology and social interaction. This is corporate form, the way that organizations work, property rights, incentives, coordination problems, right? It's like on each of these, you'd be like, swing and a miss, swing and a miss, swing and a miss, swing and a miss on every single element that goes to make it up. And so would I. Third one. Um, I described to you a way of making software. Type one, fairly obvious, proprietary software, strongly protected by copyright, uh, the uh, object code, uh, is all that's distributed, or machine code is the all that's distributed to the uh, users so that they can't actually find the source code. The source code isn't given to them. Um, the material is strongly wrapped inside digital uh, rights um, management, um, protected against uh, illicit copying by both legal and technical means, um, sold to you through a license which actually doesn't really mean that you're buying it. You're simply licensing it to you, so it's restricted to a particular computer. Uh, strongly restricted and updated periodically so that everything becomes obsolete and you have to spend more money on it. Um, system number two, well, no, actually, we'll have a system which is open source. We will have a system in which uh, copying the code is completely legal. We're distributing the code um, is acceptable. If you make a modification to the code and distribute it, you are required 
to put your new code under the license that you got the original one so that you add to the commons that is out there. So it's a sort of virtuous circle. You get something that is open, and if you change it or adapt it and want to distribute that, then you have to distribute it under the same terms you got it so that there's an ever-increasing, ever-expanding spiral. Which of these two methods will flourish? If I told you that both of them would, I think this would seem extremely strange. Where are the incentives? How's it going to work? Why would companies invest in this? And IBM, by the way, IBM is the largest patent holder in the world. IBM makes twice as much every year from open source related revenues as it does from its patent portfolio. Wow. Twice as much from a form of software where the freedom to copy it is explicitly a part of the terms of distribution. I was reading this article, you may have seen it in the New York Times the other day, about how the, um, the uh, West Point is now training um, hackers uh, to defend the cyber infrastructure. And I don't know if, like me, you laughed at the point where you got to the, uh, the end of the story and they said, well, of course we use Linux, <laughs> because if you want a secure system, it has to be open. If you want a secure system, it has to be open. Now, actually, anyone who does cryptology would say, yeah, that's actually true. The dangerous algorithms are the ones that are closed because anyone is smart enough to come up with a code that he can't break, right? The, the truly secure system is the one where everyone can look at it and say, oh, oh no, wait, there's a vulnerability there, right? Uh, where the system is open to it. Um, and I just think it's fascinating the NSA and that the Army actually turned to this, this, this method of production, which, as I described it to you, would sound like something that, you know, would come with patchouli oil and candle and sandals. <laughs> the point about these is, at least if you're like me, you would have swung and missed on at least two out of three, maybe three out of three. You would have been wrong about networks. You would have been wrong about the kinds of organizational forms that can produce useful cultural objects. You would have been wrong about the way that incentives work. You would have been wrong about the kinds of culture that would have sprung up online. You would have been wrong about the productive powers of software. I mean, don't feel bad, right? I mean, there are lots of economists who thought that derivatives were a perfectly fabulous way to go. And so being wrong, you know, probably entitles you to a federal bailout. But um, <laughs> that's not my point. My point is not that you're wrong, but we're wrong always in one direction. Each of these systems, each of these choices was a choice between open and closed. And in each time, at least for me, the open version was so obviously not going to work. It was so obviously more dangerous. It was so obviously more anarchic. It was so obviously not going to produce the thing we wanted. And the closed version, I could see how it would work. It seemed plausible. It seemed credible. It seemed safe. And so I would have picked the closed version each time. And I would have been wrong, at least if the idea is pick closed only. Now, I want to say something here. I'm going to say it three times because it's very important. I am not claiming, I am not claiming, I am not claiming that open is always better. It's not. There are lots of times where we need closed systems, where we need to protect privacy, where we need to protect property rights, right? There are lots of times in which the closed choice is the correct one. Very clear. Lots of times where open is not the right choice. My point, however, is that there are reasons to believe, psychological, cognitive reasons to believe, that we have a systematic skew in our uh, perceptions, which leads us to see more of the dangers and fewer of the potential benefits of open systems, and more of the benefits and fewer of the potential dangers of closed systems. That's cultural agoraphobia, a fear of openness which leads us to skewed perceptions. So if you're at all convinced by this, what do you take away from it? What I'm hoping you take away from it is, wow, that is true. To the extent that I still operate with the same set of mental priors, mental prior judgments, the same cognitive orientation in making future decisions that I did when I would have made these prior decisions, I should be concerned that I am not missing a whole set of opportunities that I am not skewing in the direction of the closed system and not the open system. And I'm going to claim that actually we do have a reason to worry about that, but that it's not hopeless. It's not just a matter of me saying to you, oh, you have a bias, and that's the end of that. 
um, but instead it's something that we can actively, uh, we can actually do something about. Uh, the analogy I'd make is to um, uh, so-called behaviorist economics, the, 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 the behavioral economics. The behavioral economics economists have discovered something which most of us figured it was pretty obvious, which is that people don't actually think the way that economists uh, say that they think. Um, homo economicus is not, in fact, us. Um, but before we cheer and say, yes, we're so wonderful and multifaceted and novelistic and they're so reductionist stick figures, it turns out that there are patterns in the way that we think. So for, um, can I ask here, do you put up your hands, how many have, of you have ever bought a consumer appliance, an, uh, uh, excuse me, a consumer warranty over an appliance, a warranty over your refrigerator, your computer, whatever, okay. How many of you did so partly because you believed that if you didn't buy the warranty, it would break? <laughs> Me too. Um, and, and I was very guilty about it. It's like, this is really stupid. This isn't the way the world works. Mental states do not, in fact, produce. It's like, yes, but it will break to spite you. That's not the way the world works. Yes, I'll get it. Wow, only $129 for a three-year warranty. Yes, great. I'd really love it. Um, these warranties are... Um, they're, they're inexplicable uh, in a market inhabited by rational people. Um, you'd be much better off just sticking the money, of, uh, like uh, one-tenth of that amount of money in a piggy bank and using it as a reserve fund to pay for those appliances that actually do break. Um, they're almost never worthwhile. Um, believe me. I mean, if you actually do the stats and look at the premiums you're paying, the risk premiums you're paying are just absurd, right? But we all buy them. Why? or not all of us, but many of us buy them. Why? Partly it's the, you know, the universe is malevolent and will see me not buying it theory, which I don't know, says something about my Calvinist roots. But partly, but partly it is because whereas economists believe that people are risk neutral, they're indifferent between the prospects of a loss and the prospects of a gain, right? So that, that, that's, you know, we don't have, we don't skew in one direction or the other. In fact, we find that people are strongly risk averse because uh, the risk that we could imagine that then comes about makes us feel disproportionate regret, and i.e., you feel, feel like a schmuck that you didn't buy the warranty, right? This is risk-averse um, uh, 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 described in, in other language. So um, what behaviorist economics, so behavioral economics does is seek to chart patterns like that. There are other very interesting ones. And what I'm arguing is that we need a similar kind of study, and I actually would like it to be an empirical study, of attitudes towards productive systems, of attitudes towards network, and, to turn to my subject today, attitudes towards the university, towards pedagogy, towards scholarship, and towards the use of technology in scholarship and in learning. So let me go back to my um, hypotheticals. If I had asked you 17 years ago, okay, where is, I'm giving you, going to give you three options, three places where an open distributed system marked by an absence of property rights, strangers collaborating with each other, um, material which is affirmatively free to copy, where a system like that will flourish. Okay, you get to pick out of these three areas. Number one, putting together a worldwide encyclopedia. Number two, putting together an operating system. And number three, putting together teaching and learning materials. Right? Now, clearly, it is in education that an open source kind of approach has its sweet spot, right? I mean, we are teachers, which means that you can't shut us up about teaching. <laughs> I was actually listening out there. And, and it happened, I do it, everyone does it. You go to a conference, like, I do this really interesting thing where I, you know, have my students do a blog and then there's a rotation and the other people stand there going, uh-huh, 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 so that they can then tell the really interesting thing that they do. We want desperately, it's a kind of social compact, you know, I'm actually not listening to you, but I really want to tell you about the cool thing I did. Um, <laughs> actually, the idea sounded great. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> The point is teachers love to share information about the way that they teach, right? How did you learn to teach? You stole like a pirate, right? You found people who were good teachers and you thought, how do you do it? You watched them. You thought about them. You imitated them. Sometimes you even looked in the mirror and said, oh, okay, I'll do it like that, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, it, was comp it, was, it makes a sort of teenager modeling herself after Britney Spears look positively original, right? You took without frequently credit 
um, methods, questions, tr tics, trip, uh, 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 tricks, techniques, exams, and you remix them and made them your own, right? That's the way we learn to teach. And it's great, right? And of course it makes sense. And what's more, we're in a realm where, for the most part, the people whose stuff we're taking are delighted. They're so happy because they've actually found someone who's interested when they tell their story about, I do this really cool thing, where I? And actually now someone's using it, and it's so cool. And someone's using my materials, and it's so cool. So clearly, therefore, the textbook by now is dead, right? I mean, there are no textbooks anymore. I mean, obviously, we're all working out of uh, collaboratively created materials which we're free to customize for our particular circumstances. I mean, who would be bound by this kind of like fetishistic object made of dead trees which comes in an utterly invariant order uh, with all the chapters you don't need? Doesn't matter. You've got to buy them. Uh, aimed at a particular imaginary student who, of course, isn't you, your students and a particular imaginary teacher who, of course, isn't you unless you're the textbook author. Um, no, we won't. <laughs> the textbooks died. When, when did textbooks die again? I forget. Um, and as for the world of open educational materials, now, indeed, there are open edu educational materials and wonderful ones. I've worked with the people who uh, helped to put them together. MIT's Open Courseware, Connections, the wonderful site at Rice. Uh, there are lots of fascinating uh, open educational experiments. The Open University in Britain has done amazing things. I, in fact, think that the global movement around open educational resources is a fascinating one, a movement which gets the point that open materials aren't just free to copy. They're free to remake, to version, to adapt, to assemble together, right? That's the freedom that the open licenses, like Creative Commons licenses, give. It's not just the freedom to copy. It's the freedom to customize, just as with open source software. And yet, we have a flourishing open source software movement. We have a flourishing global open encyclopedia. And education, we have to say, is way behind in terms of how it is adapted. Let's take another example, academic presses. Academic presses have, if you're like me, fabulous backlists. There are amazing books out there which you can't buy anymore because, as you know, the typical academic, uh, print run of an academic monograph is between 1,000 and 1,500. So those books are no longer being commercially produced, right? So clearly, they're all available online under Creative Commons licenses, right? I mean, obviously, right? It makes sense, right? I mean, The Daily Show makes their episodes available online in full for free, right? We're at least as open as The Daily Show, right, which is owned by a large capitalist corporation, right? We, as educators and people working in scholarly publishing, right, we could aim to be as open as them, right? No, not at all. Most of those books are simply moldering in the stacks, and to the extent they are getting out there, it's because the professors, after however many years, demand their rights back and actually put them, themselves, uh, put them up themselves. This, despite the fact there is clear empirical evidence that if you make books freely available digitally, it actually drives sales. My book, for example, you don't have to read, you don't have to buy the book in which I lay out some of these ideas. You just go to thepublicdomain.org. You can download it in full for free. Yale University Press is very happy. They're also selling books, which as an academic press is something I think they're slightly unsure about since it smacks of trade. But um, <laughs> the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, a wonderful organization, does fabulous social science, was persuaded because they have a dual mission. They had to support scholarly publishing financially, but they also had to disseminate the results of their uh, social science research. It's particularly important to have good social science research in Africa for reasons that you can imagine. They were persuaded that, you know, even though we, we do to derive a substantial portion of our operating budget from our publishing revenues. You know, we have to bite the bullet and our social responsibility is greater. We're going to put all of our books under Creative Commons licenses. Their sales increased 240%, right? But they're the exception. Take networks. So the last thing we would do is like buy into something like Blackboard, right? I mean, Blackboard, that's a proprietary system, right? You can't hack Blackboard. You're limited to what Blackboard would let you do. You, you will use Moodle, right? right? No one would use Blackboard. 
Blackboard's actually a pretty good system. I'm not against proprietary systems. My point is simply that if you went through and one after another said in teaching materials, in scholarly practices, in publishing, who? Academics at least. We can trust you guys to be open, right? Not so much. The National Institutes of Health um, uh, gives $12 billion, $18 billion a year, excuse me, uh, in funding of taxpayers' money to researchers um, until recently, researchers were not required to put, deposit those articles in a way that made them available on the open web. They now are, um, a year after publication. At least the author's final manuscript has to be uh, available on the open web, uh, giving a year of exclusivity potentially to a commercial publisher. But before that, there was a voluntary deposit procedure whereby researchers were allowed to, if they wish, post copies of their own manuscripts. Okay, so you know the way scholars are with their manuscripts. I actually had to stop somebody once who was going to a funeral and wanted to take reprints with him so that he could hand it out to the various... It's like, not at a funeral, weddings. Weddings are the place for reprints, not funerals. <laughs> May I say you look lovely in coral pink. Here's uh, my recent article on semiotics. Um, okay, so we know academics love to share their stuff, what percentage of the people deposited under um, voluntary deposit? May I say they built a beautiful, very easy to operate website that would basically do everything for you. What percent? What do you think? 60? Four. Uh, four percent. Um, it, we, they got all the way to four. Um, four percent deposited voluntarily. Um, this despite the fact that there are actually fairly clear indications that open access publishing um, indicate, uh, improves your citation count, your, uh, your impact factor, et cetera. All purely self-interested. Uh, in, if we were homo economicus, we would actually be putting more stuff up. So that's the downside of the story that I've told you. I think we have a blindness towards openness and paradoxically, weirdly, bizarrely, in education, the very place where openness should thrive the most in every kind of system from the types of networks that we invest in to our practices in publications and ed in education, we seem to be tilting too far in one direction. Let me stress again, open's not always right. But there are lots of cases where it just seems like such a no-brainer that we would be better off having some kind of network of openness, right? Something where you can say, okay, I'm teaching this intro to X class, you know, basic, uh, 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 Ajax programming, um, the fundamentals of distance learning, whatever it is, surely there is a place where everybody's syllabi are up there, where I can go and not just see everyone's materials, but see the most used, see the connections. Everybody loved Jane's first introduction, but they loathe her section number two, which is her weird theory because she once studied with Derrida. So everybody ignores that and goes directly to three, but they like John's module, and they tend to slot that into module number two so that users build their own paths through the material, and those paths, those links, are then exposed to the future users. There are such systems. Connections has one, for example. But why isn't that the norm? Why isn't that just on your desktop? Why isn't that there without you even thinking about it the way it is with Google? With Google, as you may know, Google doesn't find websites and give them to you in an order by looking for the incidence of words on pages alone. If it did that, then the person who put thousands uh, of, of the same word in, in a one-point type on a white background would automatically get... Uh, the ranking. Google looks for who links to sites. If 50 copyright professors link to a particular site on copyright law, that's probably a pretty good site. That's a kind of peer review. They call it waterhole algorithms. Two possible ways of finding waterholes, right? One is you scan the jungle and look for the waterhole. The other is you look where the animals walk. We look onto the open web and we see where the animals walk. We are the animals. We leave paths because it's an open web, network number two, not network number one. Those links are vitally important data. They are the things that take all the, not all of the, much of the idiocy and bile and stupidity and misinformation and bury it below the fold 
so that we actually can use Google and retrieve useful information, despite the fact that it's probably true that most of the information on the net is wrong. Right? That's the paradox. Openness can cure openness. Imagine that kind of system for scientific literature. Now, of course, right now you can search the scientific literature for a word that was web searches as of Alta Vista in 1994, right? You can look for the word, but what you can't look for is that Sir John Sulston thinks that this is the best article on the worm genome ever published, and that would be important because he won the Nobel Prize for sequencing the worm genome. Why? Because he can't link to it because it's behind a publisher's firewall. And if the faculty of the University of Mary Washington wanted to create a meta uh, tag inserter or a web crawler that would go through all of that material and try and annotate it, they would be in violation of the contracts that you have signed with Springer and uh, Elsevier and all of the other journal editors, which would make the University of Mary Washington liable for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of dollars in liquidated damages for creating the very thing that we would need to create to get science to the level that flirting and looking for porn and buying shoes are already at. It's not much to ask, right? I would like the search for the cure for cancer to be as easy as the search for cute girls living in North Carolina, but it's not. Admittedly, this may reflect something about our social priorities, but it also reflects something about the utterly stupid, utterly stupid way we have created our scholarly universe so that the World Wide Web created in an academic lab by a bunch of scientists who wanted to share information has produced a world in which the single area least touched by it is science. Science is, in web terms, about 1993, maybe 1996, if you're incredibly optimistic. We actually have primitive search engines, but we don't have that open network. So what's the takeaway from this? First of all, I think that it's a ta there's a takeaway about the way that we make decisions. A lot of you out there have to make decisions. You make them in university libraries. You make them in classrooms. You make them sitting on provost budget committees. You make them deciding about technologies that are going to be used. You make them in deciding about intra-university collaborations. And there's generally a choice, a range of choices, about the kinds of technologies that you're going to use, the kinds of social systems you're going to uh, set up, and the number of people who you're going to let be participants, and in particular, the number of people who you're going to let redesign the system. And if you're like me, your instinct will to be to put your finger firmly on the side of control and say, oh, no, we want to we nail this down. I don't want people fudging around with this, and I think it should be exactly this way, and I don't want these users messing around with things. I know what information they need, right? I know what metadata they need. I know the way they should be getting stuff. What do you mean they don't like that? What do you mean they have their own way of looking at things? They should use my way which is, you know, all too often, unfortunately, the attitude that we take um, when we think about our users. The point is there are people out there who can do more interesting stuff with our material than anything we have ever thought of. That's just the way it is when you've got a billion people wired on the planet. Unless you have an unusually high level of self-esteem, you've got to think that there's someone out there who might be able to do more interesting things with your stuff than you can, okay? And that has a design corollary, as they say in Britain, or corollary, as you say here, which is have the maximum degree of openness possible consistent with the security of your stomach lining, your provost's fear that you're going to be turned into a nest of Russian hackers, um, your general counsel's fear is that you'll all be liable for substantial liquidated damages for becoming a pirate haven, and so forth. We need to think more seriously about openness. The second thing we need to think about is we actually need to start taking seriously the stuff that we all say. We all wander around going, oh, it's an interdisciplinary world right now. It's an interdisciplinary world. It's an interdisciplinary world. I mean, you know, I actually would love to have, find someone who goes, no, it's not. You know, knowledge is confined squarely within disciplinary boundaries, and it never strays over the edge. That, at least, would be a radical position. But, 
we all go around saying, no, it's an interdisciplinary world. That has a logical consequence, right? If it's an interdisciplinary world, then your assumption that you know who's going to use your material, who's going to take your course, who's going to read your article, who's going to use your technology is wrong, right? You don't, right? Because the point is you know your discipline. You have a great idea about the people in your discipline. You have a little mental model. You've met them at conferences. You were trained by them. You have inhabited their mental map. Hopefully you've stretched it here and there, but it's still basically their mental map. And the point is there's a person who's making use of your material or could make use of your material who you haven't even imagined. Everyone is an edge case on somebody else's discipline, right? We all are. And that has design consequences, and those design consequences militate in favor of greater openness. The great thing about this is that I actually think we have substantial freedom to experiment. Right now in academia, we are being more timid with our content and our material than Viacom. Okay? That's pathetic. I mean, it really is. That's pathetic. I mean, why on earth are we so scared? Right? Yes, there are risks. There are real risks. We need to think about it. I do not want someone editing my intellectual property notes and putting them out under my name with all kinds of you know, great claims like the whole Holocaust thing was a myth. Right? That's true. That's a concern. Right? But there are also concerns on the other side of the ledger. There are concerns about losing potential audiences, losing people who will engage with materials. In every technology and type of literacy, there is a moment where people fight over the possibility of enlarging or opening the franchise. There was this whole letting women vote thing, you know? Uh, you know it, it aroused some concerns at the time, right? Um, the franchise um, tended to be restricted to people who looked rather more like me. Um, there was the whole idea of large-scale um, uh, large scale reading of the Bible in your native language as opposed to some arcane sacred tongue that was taught only to the priestly elite. There was the scribal conventions, which made it almost impossible to learn how to write deliberately because the scribes had a very strong incentive to restrict access to literacy since you had to come through them. If you go back and look at Sumerian scribal conventions. They're hilarious. 23 th signs that are exactly the same thing but mean different things depending on context, right? Um, that you need intensive, they are des it's designed to be impenetrable, right? It's, that's not a bug, it's a feature. Lawyers, right, are masters of this, right? We have our own languages, you can't speak them, you have to pay us to speak them for you, uh, and unless we speak in our tongues, then stuff doesn't happen, right? Um, we used to do this, we used to actually do this officially. We had law French, right? It was actually a different language. Now we just pretend we're speaking English, but it's just a kind of English that none of you would ever want to speak, right? Every profession is a conspiracy, uh, as someone once said. The point is that in each of these areas, there were genuine and not unjustified fears. What happens when we suddenly enlarge the franchise and all these people who we haven't yet given education to can suddenly vote? Will it lead to demagogues? What happens when we have these amazing new communications technologies so that someone can speak to millions through a simple microphone or over a TV camera? What will happen when, ah, my God, the Bible is suddenly in the vernacular and now anyone can comment on it? There will be heresy. Check. There will be heretical splitting off of other sects check. Yes, and there will also be debate and openness and the enlightenment, right? The point is that at each of these stages, we have had concerns, real concerns, justified concerns about how we as a society would deal with openness. What is fascinating to me and frankly very sad is that in the world of education, we have not fully grappled with those and come down firmly on the sides of openness. So I'll close with a set of simple um, design principles. Firstly, the norm should be open. That should be the default. If someone's arguing for something else, then the burden of proof should be on them. Uh, if the case is the student's social security numbers, that's an e easy burden to meet. No, that should not be up on the open web. If it's the professor's scholarship, I think the case is going to be pr profoundly easier. The ma course materials that we produce, 
why exactly is it we need to control them and limit uh, dissemination of them? And maybe there's a reason, but again, I think the burden of proof should be on the person who's making that case. I think universities, it's university, right? The meaning of the term, right? It's not let's hold on to everything or city, right? Um, when it comes to uh, our scholarly presses, they rightly so are worried about the future of digital publishing. But sadly, in my view, they are embracing a vision in which their goal is to hang on to every tiny fragment of content and to mine that content for revenue streams. Every year I get a, a royalty statement for one of my earlier books, and one of the um, sections of the royalty statement is for permissions fees. And because I'm sort of fanatic about this stuff, I actually go and look to see what kinds of things people are paying for. They're paying for reproducing paragraphs in their materials. That's fair use. You don't need to pay because you already have that right under the Copyright Act, under Section 107 of the Copyright Act, and more than just paragraphs, I should say. I think that's a bad path for university presses to go down. There are paths to financial sustainability that go down the other realm. And finally, in the realm of our technical systems, I think we ought to think much more about the possibilities of making them open where possible where it's not going to screw everything up, at least as a matter of experiment, can I leave the system open so that the users can actually modify it through their behavior, so that it actually responds to the way that people use it? Some of you out there are probably librarians or know one, uh, or know someone who plays one on TV. And if you're involved in digital libraries, you know the dirty little secret of digital libraries, which is that millions of dollars are spent creating incredibly fancy digital repositories with gorgeous, elaborate metadata, and nobody uses them. Because they were assembled by a bunch of people who really knew what the users wanted. Just wasn't actually what the users wanted. <laughs> right? The point is, in each of these areas, we can afford to unbend just a little bit. In pilot training, Pilots are trained to doubt their own perceptions because when you fly in cloud, your inner ear will tell you that you are climbing when you aren't. And so you don't trust your inner ear. You look at the inclinometer and you believe what it tells you. You learn to distrust your perceptions productively. As educators, we need to learn to distrust our cultural agoraphobia. That's only the beginning of the journey, but I think it would be a really exhilarating one. Thank you very much. Questions? I should say now, no, there aren't going to be any questions. I'm, I have my own views, and I'm not responding to anyone. I think there's a gentleman at the back, all the way at the back. No, because apparently they're remote viewers. All the way, the gentleman all the way back there? Uh, right there. Um, the, um, I, I'm told that it's best if we use the mics because there are actually 24 viewers watching this live. Probably by mistake, but still. <laughs> The, the porn is after this. Right. Sorry, yes. Could you perhaps speak a little bit about openness and in, 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 in that context, the need to preserve institutional academic identity? Um, I think, you know, as, as you spoke about the anxieties we have about sharing, uh, one of the things that we need to preserve in a meaningful sense is the accumulated record of the institution's academic identity. And I think that's, that goes beyond the copyright issue and the sharing issue, but really goes to the heart of what we're all about. And, and in that context, the library and content management become, become critical path issues. Perhaps you have to. So that's a very good point. And I actually think there are, there's a whole series of areas where your comment raises interesting questions. One is simply the issue of... Um, at digital repositories. Uh, what's our archival duty? Um, I think that correctly understood openness is not um, uh, inconsistent with uh, archival care. Um, after all, one of the best strategies for making sure that things stay around is just having as many copies of them as possible. We, we know this from, from history. 
Um, but I think the key there is um, actual marking and tagging um, so that we identify this is the authorized version. This is what was actually produced by the MIT faculty, right? Um, and that's something which I think our scholarly um, traditions are actually evolving towards. There are wonderful uh, technical uh, devices that help us use that, such as DSpace, which was developed, um, not codes, incidentally at MIT. Um, and I think uh, one thing that we have to think about is, to the extent that metadata are the way that we identify the true copy or the original copy or the default copy or the University of Mary Washington copy, we need to take that seriously, and that actually may be a matter where you actually have to not just take it seriously but fund it. So maybe NIH or maybe the NEA or whomever NEH has to say, okay, 0.5 of a percent of every grant goes to marking and tagging because that's the way this information is useful. It's no use just copying it if we don't know what it means or who it is or how it relates to other stuff. But I actually think that's something where we have tools and what we need to do is make it so that that stuff is automatically generated by users as we go along. So, so I think that that's very important. So moving now just to the level of practice. So when MIT went to develop their open courseware site, uh, their open courseware practice, this was a real concern that they had. Um, you know, they were genuinely worried, and for, for you know, very good reasons, that first of all, people would change what they said, would put it up so that some, someone would come in and apparently change, some, change something so that it had an, an MIT professor saying that they believed in uh, creationism or that they believed in uh, the idea of perpetual motion or what have you. Um, but they were also extremely concerned that uh, even well-meaning um, uh, changes of the, of the documents could make vital errors. And, you know, if it's an engineering course on how to keep a bridge, make a bridge that doesn't fall down, we actually, you know, kind of want this, the, uh, the equations to be right. Um, in that context, what they found was um, that, I won't say that there were no concerns, but that the, f the fears were less than they had imagined. Um, the people who were using it were extremely careful, were as obsessive about getting it right as they were. So one of the great virtues of the open licensing was that all these people around the world went out to translate this material, all without having to ask permission because permission had already been given. Um, then they found that, so for example, this, I love this story, someone in Taiwan and someone in the, the People's Republic of China, they're both translating the same courses. Um, and so they say, well, we should actually check our translations against each other. And so this group actually forms an academic detente around a purely technical issue, which is let's make sure we're getting it right. Uh, and that in turn leads to a connection with the MIT faculty member who originally does it. So I think so our experience with Creative Commons was that networks come into being to solve problems. You don't create a network and then say, now go and solve a problem. It's the other way around. Like there's a problem and a network accretes around it. And I actually think that in a lot of these cases, it's remarkable how networks gr sp sort of spring up to solve these problems. That sounds like sort of hand-waving, uh, but I do think that it reflects the premise that I started with. We're very good at seeing the downsides and not good at imagining how openness could actually foster the process of self-correction. And certainly, what I found amazing, and I'm actually no longer a, the, the, the chair of, of Creative Commons, uh, I, I should have given Martha a more up-to-date bio. I, I stepped down at the end of uh, last month. But uh, what I had found with, um, with Creative Commons is we had all these fears. You know, I was sure someone was going to Creative Commons license a Britney Spears song. I was sure that there was going to be you know, Creative Commons porn. I was sure that, you know, we, I, I went through, I'm a lawyer, right? I came, went through an endless series of dreadful scenarios. You know, and most of them didn't come to pass, but a huge number of fabulous scenarios that I'd had no way of imagining did come to pass. So I guess that experience has sort of tilted my mental framework. I guess that's why I'm optimistic, despite being Scottish. I, I'm particularly cognizant of this notion of, of the responsibility of educational institutions to spread knowledge and to be open. Um, but I want to take a different angle on that, and that is, I mean, here we are at the University of Mary Washington, a state-supported institution. Um, how much movement, if any, has there been on the part of, of states to say, um, we, we pay you all, we pay your salaries, the stuff that you produce is, in fact, uh, public, should be in the public domain and should yeah. be open. I, mean, I, know that, I know that there are particular faculties have have made uh, statements about this and making those things open. But I, I wondered if there's any kind of 
movement on the part of states to, to push this? Very little, and it's very episodic. I mean, it's little pieces here and there. So for example, at, um, in uh, North Carolina, there's a wonderful organization, really worth checking out their site, uh, because for me, it's sort of what I would imagine um, K-12 education might look like in, like in five to eight years, called LearnNC, uh, learnnc.org, um, funded by the state. Basically, what LearnNC does is create, help teachers create, uh, state uh, school teachers create uh, learning objects that fit in with the school's, with the state's manda mandatory uh, curriculum, and then tag them. So if you are teaching third grade geography, right, this course is for you, right? So LearnNC does that and aggregates them, and they have tag clouds and all, other, all the cool stuff that you could imagine putting in. So, you know, I am a second grade teacher who lives in Alamance County. What are the field trips within 50 miles of me, <laughs> right, that fit the state guidelines, such and such? And this was, I mean, the amount of money necessary to do this was trivial. It was like a rounding error, right? And when you do it, you go, of course, right? Of, of course I want my kid to have that. And of course that ought to be happening on any, every level of education. But in, instead, the reaction is the reverse. People bring up real fears. Again, I want to stress, there are always real fears, right? So one is, wait, so the state's going to take away the intellectual property of all the people who work for the state? Oh, well, first of all, the good faculty are never going to work for the state. And secondly, then the state might has the copyright, and they could suppress anything that they didn't like. I'm a First Amendment believer. That really concerns me. So to the extent you implement it, you'd have to implement it in a way to make sure that those things were impossible, right? So you'd have to preserve attribution, for example, so that it's always clearly marked. But also to say, you can't change it, and to maintain the uh, right, the academic freedom of the people concerned. So there are real concerns, right? I, I really want to stress this. These people aren't just bad actors who are driving things down. But what's fascinating to me is how we fixate on the real concerns rather than saying, yeah, these are real concerns, now let's solve them. Whereas when you see them in operation, it's just like, this is wonderful, this is amazing. Other examples of where this has happened, obviously NIH funding researchers. John Conyers introduced a bill which would ban any government agency from ever requiring that anyone who took their money actually make their stuff freely available so long as anyone else expended labor on it. So that's like typesetting it, say. Right? So this is great, right? This isn't just, are they doing it? Well, no, there's resistance. This is, let's forbid the government from actually making the research that taxpayers have paid to fund open. Right? That's how far away we are from the discussion that we should be having. He's like, no, we should forbid it. It's like, no, we should mandate it, right? And he's, he's uh, irritated because he thinks mandating it is communism. Because why is it communism? Because you're telling authors what they have to do with their copyrights. Because first of all, no, you're not. You're saying if you want to take the money, it comes with this condition. Take it or not, <laughs> here's the condition. Secondly, that's what the journals do. Right? You submit your article to the journal, they take your copyright too. The only difference here is people can actually read it without paying money. So we are again and again and again, there's this asymmetry in the way that we view these issues. And that's why the very interesting initiative that you suggest, I think, is yet to fully um, come about. Yes, you do. I'm sorry. They, they, they made me promise to be. A hard art. But it would be nice, actually, if I went to one of these and the mic was simply thrown. You know, that would be kind of, you know. Uh, I have a couple comments. One about the uh, pet lack of PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a uh, communications design specialist named Dar uh, Edward Tufte. You've probably heard of him. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a couple of his seminars. He never uses PowerPoint because he thinks it restricts the communicative ability that he has to use body language to communicate with his audience. Um, as far as the question, the original question, 1992, I was sort of around, you know, biologically and also <laughs> technologically in 1992. And what I remember from that period, and I was involved in web production, web design, even though I'm an art historian, uh, was the energy of the web and the potential. In other words, I would kind of take the perspective, and it's not just to say that I would choose, but I think that 
the creators of the web, HTML, the whole like, notion of sharing information, that, that really drove the development of the web and I think continues to drive it, maybe outside of academic circles. So there's this enormous, this thing came about because of, of the, the, the empowerment that it gives the individual to publish their own materials. And I also think it's, I kind of have the, at least the faculty members that I associate with, are, like you pointed out, excited about sharing information all the time. This is what we do. You know, we try to get students interested in things we have enthusiasm for. So I'm just, uh, the question then, so these are some statements, is simply uh, what's whole, I agree with your vision of the limitations that we have as an academic community. I think that's a big contribution to my perspective. I hadn't really thought about that, that there's so many restrictions on this information and there really shouldn't be because it's not our job to restrict mm -hmm. information. Um, where is the, where, where's the um, obstacle? Where are the obstacles to this? In other words, asking more like as a faculty member who's interested in promoting this openness, um, it, does it lie with the administration, mm -hmm. hierarchical administrative mm -hmm. structures? It lies with publishers. They're worried about the bottom line in terms of their... I mean, academic, my idea of academic publication is you don't make any money with it anyway, so you might as well publish it on the web because I never really saw it as a venue for making a profit to begin with. So yeah. that's the question. It's a great question. So where, where is where's the obstacle? Um, so first, let me just go back to one of your observations. Um, back in, n not 92, but uh, 94, 95, um, the government was already moving to respond to the web. And this is, for those of you who you know live close to Washington, this is an astoundingly speedy response, right? I mean, within like two or three years of something emerging, we're already like acknowledging it's a big deal. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I think the federal government's about to move on the, the automobile soon, you know, but uh, it's an unproven technology, you know. Um, so this was just this kind of amazingly quick response. And the response was that all the energy and excitement and sort of openness, which I completely agree with you, was sort of inside that community, they saw this as a kind of... Um, zitty adolescent precursor to the real internet, which was going to emerge later, which was going to be mature, which was going to be called the National Information Infrastructure. I don't know if you remember this. Um, the Information Superhighway. You were going to need a driver's license to be on the Information Superhighway. Um, it was going to be, you know, and then, and the whole point about this was we were going to get rid of all of these bugs you know, it's open, anyone can connect to it, all that, all that bad stuff. That was like, that was the prototype. We'd get rid of that and make it a real network, right? And the trouble was, from my point of view, the happy trouble, the net succeeded too fast, right? So yeah, people go, well, no one will use this. It's like, but, but they are. It's like, no one would make money on it, but, but, but they are. <laughs> so it was sort of like the ability to say that it was impossible was slightly undermined by the fact that it was happening. Um, which, you know, that we, governments can still say it's impossible, right? But just, it's harder. Where does the obstacle lie? I wish that the obstacle was in, you know, um, uh, anal, anally retentive deans and, and um, you know, grasping publishers and so forth. To be sure, there are problems with hierarchy everywhere. There are problems um, in making um, the incentives of scholarly publishing align with the mission of scholarly publishing. I think those, it's not impossible to reconcile the two, actually. I think it's possible to imagine a future in which publishers make a lot of money and stuff is open. Right? I actually think that those two are more con congruent than we believe. Yes, those are problems. But I think the fundamental problem is actually deeper than that. I think, um, first of all, I think academia, despite the fact we love to think we're all iconoclasts, is actually a pretty conservative place. Um, I think um, that uh, it is remarkable to me, working with Creative Commons, I was working with people who were used to Silicon Valley time of getting things done. It's not academic time. You know, it's not, wow, this is a great idea. You know, start the committee yeah, now as an assistant professor. By the time you retire, you know, we'll be moving towards a report, you know. Um, uh, it, uh, it really was kind of like fa failure is good, right? This idea that failure is good. Fail early, fail often. This is not an idea I had been exposed to much in my academic career. Um, but above all, I think that there's a f more fundamental, actual anthropological reason. Our experience of property for most of our lives, and it may not be true of the people who are born digital, but even there I think it is, 
is with property that's like this. It's rival. This is what economists would call it. If I've got this water, you can't have it. It's excludable. You can't actually have it. Um, I have it behind my back. I control it. I've got property rights over it. And in a world of property like this, then a set of intuitions in which control and closed systems and hierarchical organization all make a lot of sense. If we have a field, it's pretty important for, for me to know whether you own it or I own it. Because we're certainly not going to be able to plow it very efficiently or decide what we grow unless it's clear who owns it. And it's also probably the case that I want the power to exclude people from it so that I can stop people taking the stuff that I grow. And I can decide to have my workers on it and then I can fire them when they don't you know, work with sufficient assiduousness and so forth. And all of our attitudes towards property and organization grow up in a world of stuff like this. But stuff like this doesn't live on networks. Right? The stuff that lives on networks are bottles of water that every person on the planet can drink simultaneously. Right? They are fields that everyone can plow at the same time. That's not to say that there aren't problems. There are still incentive problems in getting stuff created. For example, despite the fact that um, I wrote a book called The Public Domain, I think that drug patents are an extremely important incentive for innovation, and I think we probably need to have them unless we're going to find a completely different way of financing medical research uh, to produce uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't problems, but it means that our intuitions are just off. The comparison I make is like, it's as if we grew up in gravity and we have to catch a ball thrown in free fall. We're just going to miss every time because we project a parabola that isn't there. And these assumptions get hardwired into us. We learn that a few joyful food fights or collective uh, communes notwithstanding, it is kind of better to have one person be in charge and one person own it and for there to be control. And, to, right? and some of us fight against that and some of us think there are significant exceptions even in the tangible world. But that's our base. We start from the world of closed is better. And then we move into the world of networks. And property isn't like this at all. And all of our intuitions are wrong. And we are the people who are holding us back, is I, is I think the, the answer. Um, ooh, let me stand. I'm another person who was around, actually in 1991, uh, Harvard University uh, School of Government held a workshop for the National Information Infrastructure. And by the time I got to register, there was standing room only, so I was up in the back and listening to the National Science Foundation talking about the supercomputing centers. And that was one time when the, uh, the fate of the NII and, and what was going to be. And the scientists wanted to give uh, the rest of the academy BitNet. Yeah. And they were going to take internet. And then for those who don't know BitNet, it was like uh, I grew up as a military brat living in England. And uh, for Christmas, we'd look at the wish book and we would mail order our Christmas presents and they would come. And that's how email goes by BitNet. It's transferred point to point to point. Whereas with the internet, you walk into the Sears Roebuck store and you pick it off the shelf real time. So there was that, that happening at that time. And also, I was uh, just started up uh, and funded by the National Science Foundation, the Clearinghouse for, Net for Networked Information Discovery and Retrieval initially with WACE, the wider information servers, Archie, which was searching FTP, which was the way we got files in those days, not just click and drag. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this thing called Gopher, which was a terminal-based, text-based menuing system. And then this kid in Switzerland who I met under the stairwell mm -hmm. um, embedded this other thing called the web. The point is, is that part of the, the reason those grew so fast, and primarily in the academic environment, higher ed, was that nobody knew there was money in it. Yep. Okay, that's point one. Two is that um, my charter by the National Science Foundation was to be a steward of public domain software. We didn't mm -hmm. even talk about open source. Right. And so and early on, these, you know, the notion was public domain. Now. When the trouble started, in my eye, was actually with uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, 
because Mosaic, as some of us still know it, uh, was written by or reverse engineered and by folks at NCSA. And when they wanted to go out and make it more commercial, the campus fought uh, really a, mm -hmm. a pretty big battle to keep the license of Mosaic, and then we ended up with Netscape. So I just, it's, it's an interesting time, and now I think we're seeing with the open source and openness movement, I, I'm keeping my fingers crossed this time, maybe things will happen a little bit better. That's a great series of comments, and I um, would date myself, too, by, by saying I remember all of those various protocols um, and, and indeed remember, you know, getting on, getting on email and it wasn't really clear why we were on email since it would be far easier to, you know, to, given the, the speed that my local connection worked, the mail or pro probably a carrier pigeon would have been considerably faster, but, but it was tech and, you know, we had to use it. Um, I do think there's a real point here about uh, commerce. And actually, weirdly, one of the things that is most restrictive nowadays is that you stop every conversation about a possibly exciting academic development if somebody says, this could lead to money. I mean, it's sort of like this could lead to fornication and possibly even dancing. You know, it's a sort of like, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, oh, money. And, and, it, I, and it, it's always it's polite that everyone goes, oh. And, and it's not, never clear to me what the oh really signifies. And it's, I don't think it's clear to them. Part of it is, I want my cut. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's money stuff's just bad. I mean, we're not supposed to be doing it here. You know, um, we're academics. We do things for free. You know, doing it for money, that's, that's an entirely different profession. Um, so the possibility that you have dual-use technologies, technologies which simultaneously can facilitate all kinds of nonprofit communication, but which also unlock incredible commercial opportunities, weirdly enough, in academia, that's often enough to kill the project right there. This could have incredible commercial benefits. Oh, well, in that case, you know, let's, or, you know, which is the same thing. Great, then we'll turn it over to the tech transfer office, at which point, you know, you're dead. Uh, it's like, there's, you know, it's like that's nothing going to happen. For, for one of two reasons. One is the tech transfer office is actually a full. More commonly, it is that the tech transfer office is blamed for the uh, grasping habits of the individual faculty members. You know, we, we use the TTOs, the tech transfer officers, as our, oh, you know, I would go out with you, but I can't because of a tech transfer officer. You know, um, I'm washing my hair. So um, one of the areas in which there's a concrete example of this. Let's say you're p creating open um, educational materials. Um, you're putting up your content on the web. We know from Creative Commons that people instinctively go to the most restrictive license when they start. So they put the maximum number of restrictions. Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. Right? So you have to attribute me, that's in every license. You can't use it commercially, and you can't change it. You can see why, right? The maximum control. Then after people do it for a while, then they kind of like loosen up a little bit, you know, had a couple of drinks. They're like, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll take the no derivatives clause off. You know, maybe, maybe the world won't end if somebody actually versions my material in order to teach a class in a different educational system. But the non-commercial clause, <gasps> that's a really hard one to take off. And we have a conversation with our users, like, why do you not want this material used commercially? And it's a real mixture of responses. One of them is, well, if they're making money out of it, I should be. It's like, yeah, but the thing is, you're not going to, right? I mean, the point is... <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm sorry, right? It's like if you, if you actually say pay me the licensing fee, then the odds that this is the thing they're actually going to put pick on, that's never going to happen. It's scale of free stuff that enables the commercial activity, right? The scale of it, which means that each individual person can't say, oh, you have to get me. It's like, no, I'm just going to go to somebody else who's, you know, who actually is free. But then the other reason is that there is this sense that somehow this demeans what we're doing. Whereas I have the opposite. It's like, you know, the marketplace is very good at doing certain things, right? Healthcare, not so much. Um, you know, education, arguably, not so much. But um, it's really good at some things. And in some cases, so for example, if you want your materials on public health to be available to someone in Nigeria, the way it's going to get there is because a local for-profit publisher makes a cheap version of it in print because 
web access, may, I mean, a lot of people with web access in Nigeria, as your email, uh, daily email on, on oil uh, stocks indicates. Um, but nevertheless, that's not the way to, to reach people. If you want greater access, you have to flip off that no, non-commercial switch and actually allow people to make commercial use. That doesn't mean that you always want to turn it off. But this fear of oh, commercial use is, I actually think, a, a salutary um, obstacle to a lot of the good things that we could do. I should take maybe two more questions, and then we should stop. Um, there's a question over here at the front. Sorry. Um, so if uh, Viacom is doing this and uh, Columbia University Press is not, and both are for-profit, I'm assuming some mm -hmm. publishers are for-profit for institutions, what is the market reason for one? I mean, those who are producing content for Viacom are also you know, concerned about their content going to other people. So why are they doing it? Is it because of the number of people who would want to download, uh, you know, uh, John Stewart, mm -hmm. uh, John Stewart show at night versus the number of people who would want to read what I wrote, right? Right. I'm sure lots of people would want to read what you wrote, but um, <laughs> I, I think it's partly scale. Um, I think it's partly that um, Viacom is facing an alternative distribution system, and they even sometimes refer to it as a business method, which is illicit copying, which is it's happening anyway. So we'd rather that they came to our site and saw our ads and saw it, you know, cut the way that we want it, right? And happily or sadly, um, you know, there isn't really a pirate bay for uh, scholarly monographs uh, on Lepidoptera. Uh, so you don't have the fear that makes them take the leap. And maybe that's good, maybe it's bad. The second thing is um, they are really driven to be innovative, both because of this fear and because of the pressures of the market. Whereas, you know, the old saying, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Uh, nobody ever got fired for saying, let's lock it up, right? <laughs> but people could get fired for saying, let's put it up online. I, I have a lot of experience with this in authors who put their books up under Creative Commons licenses. I always say, you need to have a very frank conversation, much franker than the one you had with your kids about the birds and the bees, with your publisher about what will happen. So you need to say, we'll put it up under Creative Commons license. He's, great. Can we just keep that site quiet, though? Like, not tell anyone. It's like, no. See, the copying of it, that's a good thing. We want people to copy it. They're like, hmm. but only from our site, right? No, the license will let anyone copy it. Can we maybe hide it so that search engines can't find it? Like, no, they just, you know, it's like they say that they want to do it, but they don't want to do it, right? They, there's, you say, no, the more copies, the better, right? You want a profusion. And so there's an enormous resistance inside of uh, publishers as a, as a reason for that. The other reason is publishers are looking forward to future revenue streams, and they see two that they believe will save them. One is the Kindle or its equivalent, in which, which I actually think academics should be deeply concerned about. It's not, I love the idea of having 1,500 books in my backpack. That's a great idea. But the idea that they're not really my books, that I can't give them to you, that I can't lend them to you, that I can't give them to a public library when I'm done, this is you know, not nice. Um, the idea that they go away when the person who sold them to me goes away, this is also not nice. And the idea they're restricted with digital rights management that take away many of my freedoms under the Copyright Act is also not nice. Um, the other one is micropayments for tiny, tiny portions, print on demand for chapters and so forth. And it's true that the Creative Commons license put the whole thing up there does you know, have potential negative interactions with those, both those revenue streams. Um, I still think that it would work better, and anecdotally, the publishers who've done it have seemed to do very well, you could say. But they might do better doing this other thing well, what we need is experiments, right? We need people to experiment. What I'd like every publisher to do is take part of your back catalog and put it under CC licenses and go look at the sales, right? It's, I'm an empiricist, right? If, if, it's, if I'm wrong, the numbers will show. I don't think I will because all the people who've done it have seen quite substantial upticks in usage and, and, and purchase. Great question. Final question? 
Just a, a comment on something you said earlier about um, when it comes to commercial applications, it seems like the uh, education sector just shuts down. I think a, a broader reason that that might be is in a way we're kind of a holdover from a medieval institution. And if things that we do get commercialized, then there's a fear that everything we do can get commercialized in time, which then feeds into all the fears about adjunct teaching and, yep. and all kinds of other bigger fears and wider fears. I think that's a much bigger and broader reason. I think you're absolutely right. And I, by the way, I share those fears. Um, yeah. I think there's a really delicate line here because many of the things that I care most about in education would be seen as bugs rather than features by a purely commercial model. Um, and all the issues you mentioned uh, are among them. So I do think that, uh, you know, I shouldn't, I was perhaps too flippant. Academics have every reason to con be concerned about commercialism. The difficulty is that the real concerns have become separated from the actual things we're worried about and become a, an all purpose anxiety about commerce. And that's where I think we go wrong. So let me give you one example of the kinds of benign interactions that I could imagine. I mentioned before this site, uh, Learn NC. So this is a site where you've got lots of teachers producing materials, tests, questions, study guides, and so forth, little, little um, modules. And they're available under Creative Commons licenses. Now, Learn NC actually says we've checked and these meet the, meet the state guidelines, but of course, for most states around the United States, no such organization exists. So I, in, in software, the people who make money about open source software are generally do the value added layer on top of the software, a layer of services that actually make them work. So when um, John Gilmore sold his company uh, to Red Hat, uh, the company, uh, I think Cygnus, had the slogan, we make free software affordable. And anyone who's actually worked with free software knows that this is not you know, a trivial point, right? Yes, there are still costs, right? And we can make them, because what we know is not how to control access to the content. We can teach you how to use it well. And we can customize it, we can va add value with services. This is what IBM does similarly with its open source. Now, imagine a world of secondary education in which we have enormous numbers of open educational materials available to anyone around the world to use. That's great, but it's still not necessarily that useful to the person in Virginia who's teaching who needs to know, does this meet the state guidelines I need to teach to the test, you know, does this fit? I could imagine a layer of for-profit institutions that comes in and says, we have the people who know the, you know, the, all these state rules, we've parsed them, we can certify this. So if you use the Boyle certified set of open educational resources, we guarantee you that they will meet the Virginia uh, standards. That's just one example. Or we can customize them to, um, you know, let's say you have uh, students with learning disabilities. We have an expertise in customizing open educational materials to them. I could imagine that layer of for-profit services sitting on top of a completely open, completely free um, educational world without destroying it or you know, corrupting it or whatever. It's just a matter of designing the incentives and the structures right. And I think if we all reasoned together, we could come up with many other examples like that without going down the road that you rightly say that we are, we are all concerned about. These have been amazing questions. Um, this, I re I'm about to go and jump on a plane to go to another conference, so I, I can't stay for the rest of the day, but I have to say this has made me regret it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Boyle. We have a small token of appreciation oh, thank you. to take with you. And um, I want to let everybody know, I promised um, Dr. Boyle that I would not read a laundry list of all of his publications in my introduction. But I want to mention one in particular, which is um, this comic book, um, Bound by Law, which he is a co-author of, and which he kindly sent along um, 50 copies of um, to distribute among conference participants. We have copies at the registration desk if you want to stop by and pick one up. They are available. Thank you very much. They are. Of course they're free. Of course they're free. Thank you.